Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. Um, I may have said this in the past. There are interviews in our interviews. Uh, this uh, interview with Chet Galasco, and, and we've become um, we've become friends. We've met and we've done some zooming. Uh, 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 Chet, uh, this is so. This interview is life. I said this to Chet before we went on air. This interview is life for everybody on the planet. Uh, uh, because the world of diabetes is what we're going to dissect and intersect. And, and Chet is author of the diabetes book. What everyone should know, there's videos. We're going to talk about that. The Challenge Diabetes Program. Uh, uh, it, it's been in my world uh, uh, since almost the day I was born. The whole notion of diabetes. And, 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 and my knowing Chet. And I'm a pharmacy graduate. I have a background, a health background. Diabetes is all over my family, so I've been so conscious about this. But as I told yet, as I uh, as as I said, uh, uh, as I'm getting to know him and reading and, and learning, there are things about diabetes, and I've been on this planet a long time. You know, I'm a septuagenarian; it's been part of my life that I never knew. Are you kidding me? I never knew this stuff, and this is not this is not deep seated research stuff. This is basic everyday life. I never knew this about diabetes. Why is Chet such an expert? Because he's had diabetes um, for 41 years. And you're going to talk about that. So there, there's so much to unpack. So again, I'm saying to everybody listening to this, this interview is life. It's your life. It's a dear one's life. It's a friend's life. It's tomorrow. It's yesterday. It's today. This is such vital stuff. Because it, 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 it's such a rampant thing. We'll talk about that too. So I, I, I've said my my monologue. It wasn't a, a Johnny Carson funny monologue. You remember him, Chet, you know? I do. <laughs> Few people I do. Know. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, before we dive in, how about just a little bit of a background? And, and then we're going to dive into the world of diabetes. Sure. Uh, it's really quickly, you know, I'm, I'm from Massachusetts, but I'm from Western Massachusetts. Uh, I was raised just outside of Springfield, which is the birthplace place of basketball. So you may have heard of that. Um, I went to school for a year at, at Drew University in New Jersey. Then I transferred to the University of Hartford because I wanted to get a business degree and not liberal arts. So after that, I, with a partner, I created a business from scratch. It was a foundry making stainless steel and high alloy castings for heavy industry. Uh, we grew that business. And then after 23 years as its president, I sold my half and went out and invested in real estate and did the, the things I really wanted to do in life, which were to write books and to, to help people. So that's where I am. Uh, I still live in the Springfield area. Um, uh, I'm married. My wife and I just celebrated our 48th anniversary last week. Happy anniversary. Got, thank you. Uh, I've got two sons and three grandchildren who Calvin and I have talked about this. So the grandchildren are, when you have them, they are the love of your life. You know, somebody asked me what I do for fun. What I do for fun is play with my grandchildren. So that's where I am in life. I got diabetes uh, when I was 29 years old which is unusual because it's kind of early for type two yeah, and yeah. kind of late for type one. But it turns out that anybody can get either type at any age. Now there are a lot of young people who get type two and a lot of uh, older people who get type one. In my case, it was type one. The way that came about is that uh, I got really, really sick. I, I never got sick. In fact, I still really get sick. But this time I was on the sofa watching TV and reading for about three days, which was really unusual. But I got better, didn't think anything of it. But a few months later, I was on a business trip. I was going to see a customer and I found myself being really, really parched. So I went to a store and bought some orange juice and I drank that to quench my thirst. But it made it even worse. When I got to see the customer, I was practically unable to talk. Wow. But I got through it. And I still didn't think much of it. It was just that was a very unusual thing that happened. But I was thirsty. No big deal. A few weeks after that, I went to a Blue Cross office on business. 
And they had a bunch of brochures there on common ailments and diabetes was one of them. I just happened to pick it up. And when I read it, I realized that I had all the symptoms except for the ones that applied to women. So I made an appointment with a doctor, went in. I didn't even have a doctor until I, I needed one to talk about this. So he was new to me. I came in and, and he asked me what brought me there. And then I told him, well, I think I've got diabetes. And he gave me this uh, look with the rolling of the eyes, like he gives every other hypochondriac that wanders in the office with their own diagnosis. And he took a blood sample, came back a few minutes later and said, well, you've got diabetes. So here I am. Um, he told me that I, I had type one, which meant I would have to take the shots every day. And from that time on, I that's what I've done. I have never had a day in over 40 years where I didn't take an insulin injection. And many times I took four or five injections. Mm -hmm. But that's what you have to do to, to control this disease. Now, I decided to explain diabetes to other people uh, because I was in Chicago during the, the week when Ron Santo was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And I'll explain to you this, his story, but you first have to know something about diabetes. We all know that high blood sugars are what cause the, the damage with diabetes, but low blood sugars can be a problem too. The reason for that is that unlike other tissues in the body, the brain takes glucose directly from the bloodstream. It doesn't store it. So when there isn't much glucose in the blood, the brain is starved for energy and things start to go haywire. You can lose your coordination, you can start sweating, you can start seeing double or triple. Luckily, it's easy to fix. All you need to do is eat something sugary. And when the blood level uh, raises, the blood glucose level raises, the brain comes back online and you get back to normal. So it's, it's not a big deal to fix it. But in the meantime, if the sugar gets low enough, you can actually pass out. And this happens in, in extreme cases. So here's the story with Ron Santo. He's in a game in Chicago. It's the last of the ninth. The Cubs are down by two. There are two outs and two men on base. Santo is in the on-deck circle. And he starts feeling the symptoms of low blood sugar coming on. Now, Santo kept his diabetes to himself because he thought the Cubs would fire him if they found out that he had diabetes. And at that time, that, that may well have been true. So he's in the circle. He can't go back to the dugout for a candy bar or anything like that. So he's just praying that the guy at the plate will make it out and retire the side. Well, instead, the guy walks. So now his base is loaded. Two outs, down by two, bottom of the ninth. Santo walks up to the plate. He said he looked up, saw three scoreboards, three pitchers, 30-some-odd people standing out in the field. When the pitcher wound up and threw the ball, it looked like it had a slinky attached to the back of it. So he took a cut at it, connected, and put it out of the park for a walk-off grand slam home run. Okay. So he made it around the bases and got back to home plate and into the dugout in time to eat his Snickers bar that, you know, soon enough that nobody knew that he had the diabetes. Now, most people would think that the drama was hitting a walk-off grand slam home run. But diabetics like me who use insulin or take certain type two medications that will you know, lower your blood sugar, we know that the real drama was what was going on in Santo's head as he's running around the bases because there was a good chance that he could have passed out in front of 20,000 people. Wow. And then his secret would have been out. So it was, it's a pretty dramatic story. Wow. When, I, when I got home, I started telling that story and I realized that people don't know much about diabetes. And in order for them to understand the story, I had to explain what was going on, just like I did a few minutes ago. Um, so I realized how much ignorance there is, but I also realized that many people believe untrue things about diabetes. I had type 1. Well, obviously, I've still got type 1. But I was asked about type 2 as well. And what I discovered is that I had misconceptions about that as well. And that's when I realized that if somebody like me doesn't understand type two at all and believe such untrue things about it, then our society really has a problem with this. Um, so I decided to start teaching people about diabetes. And that's what I've been doing for, for years now. You know, unfortunately, I had a respite uh, during COVID where, you know, we couldn't get together and everything died for three years. But now I'm back. And uh, 
I'm talking to podcasters like you, Calvin, uh, trying to, to get the facts out there. Wow. Um, can we just, before going forward, can you explain the differences, the ideology, uh, what type 1 diabetes is and what type 2 diabetes is? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't even know. Well, let's start with the way normal bodies work. When a non-diabetic person eats food, it gets digested into glucose. Glucose enters the bloodstream and it goes all over your body. Glucose is used by your body's cells for energy. Now, when the glucose enters the bloodstream, the pancreas produces a hormone called insulin. Insulin's job is to act as a key that goes into the bloodstream with the glucose, and it literally unlocks the cells so that the glucose can enter. If you don't have enough insulin, the, the sugar stays in the blood. But with enough insulin, it goes into the cells and the blood glucose level comes down. Now, before I go on, you know, you, you might wonder why high blood glucose can be a problem. Well, look at it this way. If you take a glass of water and stir sugar into it, what happens to the water? It gets sticky. Thick. Well, the exact same thing happens to your blood. When you have too much sugar in your blood, it gets sticky. And it starts adhering to your blood vessel walls, and it causes cardiovascular disease and a host of other problems. Excuse me. So that's why we have to keep our blood glucose levels in check. Now, with diabetes, there are two main types. My type is type 1. Uh, my pancreas doesn't produce insulin because I've been attacked by an, an autoimmune disease that's killed off the cells that make insulin in the pancreas. So people like me need to take insulin by injection. It breaks down in, in the digestion, so uh, you can't eat it. With type 2, it's a different disease that also happens to cause high blood glucose levels. The underlying cause there is called insulin resistance. And it's just what the name says. It makes your cells resistant to insulin so that it takes more and more insulin to open those cell walls. It gets worse over time to the point where your pancreas can no longer produce enough. And when that happens, that's when the blood levels, the blood glucose levels rise. And then you've got to somehow control them. Wow. Now, Wow. Interesting. I mean, I, I never, never fully understood that. Um, uh, so, backtracking, getting away from, um, why are you doing this? Um, why are you giving so much energy and passion, uh, and 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 so so much that you're doing now? Why? Well, I'm I'm really excited about doing this, and there are, are a few reasons. One is that I've had it for a long time, and I understand how hard it is to deal with. In researching for my book, I've talked to a lot of diabetics and found that they have the same struggles. Uh, we also, I've also found that other diabetics also are very reluctant to talk about the disease to other people because we just don't want to get the grief. Most of us have had encounters with the diabetes police, which is a, a name that the, the diabetes community uses for people who don't know what they're talking about, who feel free at the Christmas party to tell you that uh, maybe you shouldn't be eating that cookie. You know, we, we just don't need it. So we keep it to ourselves. Um, but another thing is that before COVID, I was doing classes uh, with a number of groups. And one of the things that was really gratifying for me is when somebody who was in the class would come to me afterwards and tell me that the best thing I told them was that they weren't at fault for getting this. Because both types of diabetes are caused when a genetic predisposition encounters an environmental trigger. We can't control either one of those things. But most diabetics walk around thinking that they got it because they're overweight or they ate too much sugar or all kinds of things that are just not true. And as I said, this is gratifying because when people tell me that, I can see the guilt and shame melt off their faces. All of a sudden, they feel pretty good about themselves. So that's why I'm doing it. I'd like many other people to have that same experience. 
And I'd like non-diabetics to understand what's going on so that they stop all this judgment that goes on because there is really no place for that. In my in uh, in my reading and, and researching you and doing my due diligence uh, as a journalist, uh, uh, I uncovered, and this just kind of blew me away, uh, one out of seven overweight people will get diabetes. So it's not an overweight thing. That's one thing I took away. The other is there's such a stigma. People who have it just don't want to tell anybody they have it. It's a terrible, terrible stigma. And the other thing I learned that it's because of silence, they don't ask for help. They don't ask for uh, uh, to share these experiences like you are. Uh, so you know the, the whole stigma thing and and the silence uh, aspect of of it. Um, so uh, it it doesn't start because somebody's overweight. It doesn't start because somebody is sedentary and sits all day. Uh, um, so talk a little bit more. Uh, you just mentioned you know it's it's genetic. It's a genetic thing, maybe kicked off by some environmental things. Well, that that's what. Uh... That's what the science says. As a matter of fact, the University of Massachusetts, just over the past couple of years, completed a study, and they identified over 200 genes that are uh, connected with type 2 diabetes. Wow. So the, the more we learn, the more we understand that's true. And as you mentioned, only about one out of seven overweight people becomes diabetic. All you really have to do is look around and realize that overweight people don't necessarily become diabetic. And at the same time, many thin people do. So what's up with that? You know, the, the genetic predisposition and the environmental trigger is what explains that. Now, having talked about being overweight, being overweight does play into managing blood glucose levels, uh, but not in the way most people think. We have two different types of fat. There's a... Uh, um, Subcutaneous fat, which is the soft, squishy stuff that's under your skin. That's what we think of when we think of fat. But there's also a fat called visceral fat that's internal, it's hard, and it's packed around your organs. The visceral fat makes insulin resistance worse. So it's good to lose weight, especially because visceral fat is the first fat to go when you do lose weight. That's why if you only lose 5 to 7% of your body weight, it makes a difference because you are making the insulin resistance better. So, you know, fat plays in in that way, but it's not like it causes it. And, and that's what the big misconception is. I just, you know, the, this stuff never goes away, Kellen. Just recently, I, I read a, a, a report by a couple of doctors, and they said that uh, they believe that uh, being overweight causes diabetes because they found that when people lose weight, that the uh, blood sugar level improves. Well, they don't offer any scientific reason for that happening. But what they probably saw is that the things that you do to lose weight are the same things you do to control your blood glucose level. So if you're eating fewer carbohydrates and exercising more to lose weight, well, sure, you're going to lose the weight. But at the same time, you're going to reduce your blood glucose level. You know, so it, it's not causation, it's it's correlation. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the kind of stuff that I see out there all of the time. Uh, I spent a lot of time reading actual scientific studies because rather than taking things at face value, especially the stuff you see on the web, if you go to the original source, what you find is that the actual studies, that they often don't come up with hard facts. They'll say, well, it seems that. Or some people believe, you know, there are th these weasel phrases all the time where it's not a hard fact. What I'm telling you and everybody else is stuff that's verified fact, but there's a lot of it that is speculation. Unfortunately, that just reinforces this idea that weight causes diabetes. Uh, so that, that's probably the biggest single fight we have is to get rid of that concept. Right, right. Um, off topic. Um just your opinion. Uh, I do a lot of, I stumbled upon a, a philosopher out in Vancouver, uh, teach philosophy. He's also an AI expert. And we became friends and I interview him every six weeks. We talk about everything. Uh, we even talked about um, uh, how AI will help us 
talk to Jesus and mm -hmm. what a provocative uh and in in and yes he uh it it will give us more ammunition and 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 but uh but we talk about so many different things uh and, and I'm fascinated by AI I, I actually use it um and, and I don't have a problem necessarily with it it, it it's uh uh, sometimes I, I ask it the most ridiculous things before I go out of the house to go shopping, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll... so my question to you off topic is, do you see AI down the road coming out with more help for the diabetic community? Maybe even more, you know, somebody's born and maybe looking at their whole giving AI their whole genetic thing and maybe finding things to that's my question will a may can ai help we don't know well it, it it's possible um you know the thing with ai and i'm no ai expert but i know it pulls information from all kinds of different sources and it really depends on how valid the sources are that they're pulling it from so as long as you've got solid information at the base, it'll probably help tremendously. But if it's going to be contaminated by stuff that isn't true, well, then, you know, it, it can be pretty dicey. But having said that, uh, there's been a develop over the past few years where they found a way to delay the onset of type 1 diabetes. But they have to identify the people who are most at risk for it so they can treat them before they get it. So if AI could help identify those people, then yeah, that's a way that it could help. Okay. Uh, it might, you know, even I mentioned the genetic being genetics being the basis of all this. If you could identify individual people who have the genes that underlie type two or type one, well, then you could get them to treat it earlier. The way you treat pre-diabetes, by the way, well, this is kind of getting a little deep. Um, whether you have prediabetes, which means your blood sugars are high, but not high enough to be classified as diabetes, the way you treat it is the same way you treat diabetes. You watch what you're eating and you exercise. And if you could identify people who have the genes and they started watching what they eat and exercising early on, their, their futures are going to look a lot brighter. Okay. So, yeah, it would help in that regard. Okay. Uh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago uh, i went to a lecture in new york um uh uh at the museum um uh natural history there was a lecture uh, and, and 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 there was an author there who wrote physics of the future uh um his name escapes me at this second it'll come back to me uh but it was so interesting because in one of his chapters he's talking about the future and and down the road a bit, uh, some guy is shaving. Uh, Michio Kaku is his name. Michio Kaku. He's a brilliant futurist and, and physicist. Brilliant, off the charts. So he wrote physics uh, of the, the future. I got a picture with him, and it was a great lecture. Then he wrote the book, and I, I bought the book. So down the road, there's a guy shaving in the future. And, and he's shaving. He's looking in the mirror. And all around the mirror, uh, in the wallpaper... Are are um, little little things that are looking through him. So while he's shaving, um, I shaved before. While he's shaving, the 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 wallpaper is looking through him, and the wallpaper finds one cancer cell. So he takes that information, goes to a doctor, and and they inject him with this one little thing, and that one little thing finds that one cancer cell. Done. So uh, in talking to you, and, and we're talking about diabetes, you know, maybe someday, you know, that wallpaper will see something in the genetic thing. And, you know, I, anyway, just um, just a thought. Well, one more uh, off-topic question, and uh, I have a few more, but uh, I, I like to ask this. Uh, it's one of my favorite questions, really off-topic, and you don't have to answer it, but uh, here it goes. Um, Excluding a, a family or friends, somebody living or dead, you'd like to spend a day with. And there's no rules. If there's more than one, that's fine. 
excluding family or friends, somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with. I just finished reading a book about Teddy Roosevelt. Oh. And uh, Teddy was a pretty interesting guy. Now, this guy had energy that you and I can only dream of. Correct. And he was into a lot of things, and he made a lot of big changes. But he also understood the limits of the changes that he wanted to make. Uh, like with antitrust, for example, he understood that some of these corporations were really abusive. But his point with that he told people was, uh, don't attack companies just because they're big. Just because they're big doesn't mean they're bad. But if you're big and bad, you need to be broken up. And I thought that his coming up with a, a really good idea, but understanding his limitations was powerful. And so he, he's one guy I would definitely like to, to meet. Funny you said that. During the pandemic, uh, uh, I um, wanted to occupy a lot of time. So I, I'm a big documentary guy. Uh, I, I can't I can't watch stupid movies that are not real. It's just not in me. So I ordered documentary. So I ordered uh, uh, from Ken Burns, who I love dearly. Yep. Just the best. He, man, I think he's from your neck of the woods, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I love, 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 love. I mean, he did his thing on the Vietnam War, which, you know, I'm part of. Uh, was, uh, but he, he he did a thing called the Intimate History of the Roosevelt's. So it's Teddy, Franklin, and Eleanor. Mm -hmm. In detail, I mean, it was many, many hours. And it blew me away to realize unbelievably how great this man was. And America looks the way it looks today because of Teddy Roosevelt. In a lot of ways, it's in true. Lot, yep, in a lot of ways, you know, his conservation work, his preservation work, and in, in national parks, I mean, all this stuff, uh, so much, uh, and 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 you know, he used to go on these things in the Amazon and stuff, and he almost died. Uh, it's quite so. You know, that's a great um, thing. That that's a great answer you gave me. Well, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. All right, back to work. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the stigma. Uh, uh, the stigma is a dangerous thing, isn't it? because it, it is yeah it is it and it's not just because uh of the way people feel it's it's got real consequences because diabetics don't share that they've got diabetes and i'll, I'll give you my own personal example i ran into a, a former employee i had known this guy for about 40 years um he was in a wheelchair he told me that he had diabetes and didn't take care of it so Eventually, he couldn't take the pain anymore, so he went to the hospital. They took one leg on one day and the other one on the next. A couple of years later, he died, and I went to his wake. This is one guy who didn't know I had diabetes because I kept it secret for 30 years. I didn't tell anybody that I had it because I didn't want anybody thinking I was less able than other people. Uh, this company that I started with a partner, uh, was a foundry, as I mentioned. That meant we were pouring metal uh, at 3,000 degrees, 3,000 pounds at a time. And it can be dangerous, so you don't want to be working with somebody that you're not sure is going to be able to do it. So that was one of the reasons I kept it to myself. I never had an incident, so uh, I was justified in doing that. But as I went to Jerry's wake, I thought to myself, what would have happened if I hadn't been so secretive about my diabetes? Wow. Maybe if he had known that I had diabetes, he would have come to me and said, Chet, I got diabetes. What can you tell me about it? Oh. Well, maybe maybe I could have told him what it was all about, and he would have gotten the help he needed, but I didn't. But when you've got the, you know, pretty much all diabetics being this way to one degree or another, this is a lot of communication that ought to be happening that isn't. And there's also peer support that ought to be happening that isn't. I have a a friend, she uh, she did the design work on, on the covers for, for uh, my books. She oh, can I just uh, hold up? I want sure. to hold up. Just important, just the diabetes book, which is it's a great um, it's a great cover, you know. Um, Thank you. Uh, it really is, and and, and and I picked this one up from diabetes book. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about 
know your writing, but continue. Sure. Well, uh, her name is Valley, and uh, Valley and I talked a, a couple of years ago, and she told me that she had diabetes. You know, she had gotten it not not too long before. She went to the doctor, and the doctor prescribed her a medication. She goes to the pharmacy. They're going to charge her a few hundred bucks for the prescription. And she said, I'm not going to pay that kind of money for a prescription. So she told her to put it back on the shelf. Wow. And then she said, she, she went back, and she, she said, I did the design work on your book, but I never read it. So she read it, and she did what I suggested, which is basic diabetes fact, which is reduce your carbohydrate intake and exercise more. So she watched her carbohydrates, went for a 20 minute walk every day, uh, went to the doctor a few months later and her blood sugars had come back down to normal. She said he gave her a one man standing ovation and then asked her how she did it. So she explained it to him. Well, you know, this is another problem we have here. You know, doctors are too ready to prescribe a medication where they they don't have the time, I guess, to explain that if you watch your diet and you exercise, you can control this. Not in every case, but in very many cases, you can. Uh, this is something else I'm trying to get out there. You know, be before you go to the extreme lengths, you know, do the basics. Well, anyway, the reason I bring this up now is that once Valley realized how this basic stuff worked, she brought it up to friends of hers and she said, I'm in these groups. And you wouldn't believe how many of these people have diabetes. Nobody was talking about it. Wow. Nobody wants to talk about it. So, I mean, Calvin, this is a very common thing. That's why we have to get rid of the stigma, uh, respect people who fight the disease, you know, stop blaming people for something they didn't cause themselves and let people interact, you know, the way uh, victims of other diseases do. Now, I, I would never equate diabetes with cancer. But look at what cancer uh, victims do. You know, they get together, they support each other. You know, anybody in the public who knows they have cancer, you know, pats them on the back and, and gives them credit for, for working hard to get rid of it. I mean, we all do that. But that same attitude ought to apply to diabetics as well. And uh, that that's something I'm, I'm really working to achieve. That doesn't. You know, Sydney, I'm listening to you. I'm, uh, uh, I'm going through... Uh, like a computer, my massive amount of people that I'm connected to in my world, you know, I've been journalists out there in the world. And um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to say is I, the thousands of people I know uh, in my immediate world, because I've been out there, uh, I can't, I can't put my finger on any one of them to say they're diabetic because I don't know. Right. So and 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 the odds are, out of those, I mean, I got five thousand Facebook friends, uh, and basically they're most of them I know really and handpick, and my LinkedIn. Well, that that Facebook people I've I interacted with, you know, I've gone to things and music and this and that. But uh, my whole world of the people I know, and I don't know why. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily come up sitting at a basketball game. Hey, I have diabetes. But the point being, which which magnifies what you just said is out of the thousands of people in my world i can't put a finger on not one of them to say that i know they have diabetes right it, as a rule of thumb uh 10 to 15 percent of the people you know have diabetes oh, i have no I, and i'd have no idea no if, why would i i mean uh so that leads that leads to my next it's a good segue, uh, actually, and it needs to, my, my next question, uh, how really important is it, how important it is, is it to connect to people in your community and, and friends and others who share this world of diabetes? It's important because the tendency is to beat yourself up for not controlling this better. Some people think that they're going to be in trouble if they don't have normal blood sugar levels. Well, if you have diabetes, uh, depending on how long you've had it and how severe it is, it may be impossible to get down to a, an average blood sugar level that's normal. That's really hard to do. Uh, I don't. Mine aren't aren't normal, but they're you know probably fifteen percent higher than what normal is, and I'm told that I've got very good control. 
the, it's important for people to understand how hard this is to do and that everybody struggles with it. Nobody is perfect, but you got to have reasonable standards for yourself, meaning that understand that your body can probably tolerate uh, higher blood sugars, moderately higher blood sugars. And if you can achieve that, you can live a long, healthy life. So don't set standards that are impossible. Understand that uh, everybody struggles and that you are not alone, yeah, that we all fall off the wagon sometimes. And it, it's unavoidable because there are very few certainties in diabetes. To give you one example, Calvin, you know, we like to uh, identify the carbohydrates we're eating. You know, are we eating a lot? Are we eating less? Well, if you look at a package that lists the carbohydrate content, there's a 20% margin of error on that. So even when they quantify it, you really don't know. So there's a lot of stuff here that's, it's soft. You know, there's a lot of gray areas. So all you can do is the best you can. And if you wind up with a high blood sugar, go for a walk, drink some water, take some insulin, whatever you need to do, get it back down and move on. And then don't ruminate about it. Okay. So it's that kind of thing that we can give each other, you know, get, we're all in the same boat and, uh, you know, either you're better at it or you're worse at it. And if you're worse at it, then learn from other people what you can do to, to get better at it. So it's the sharing, it's the connecting, it's the discovering. I mean, I would, I listen. I uh, in in a, in a perfect in a perfect world, I'd love people to see this and can and say, "Hey, Kevin, I saw that the interview with Czech Alaska. Uh, talk to me a little bit about it." And I mean, I would love that to happen. Talk to me a little bit. I have diabetes. I said, of course, I'd say I, I never knew, and how would I know? Uh, right. How would I know? Um, a good segue. I I watched your your marvelous. Uh, video last night that you're going to be making public soon and i'll be promoting that video when it comes up because uh, it's just it's a marvelous video and it's funny um um towards the end uh of the sh it's 23 minutes uh but towards the end the, you had a, a great picture which i copied and I'm, I'm i got your permission to use it but uh, people can see it this is just to me this just captures that world uh, of stigma and you're alone. Uh, talk about that picture. It's great. Sure. Um, these are uh, figures walking on a tightrope, which is what diabetics do, especially if you take uh, type 2 drugs that will lower your blood sugar or insulin, uh, where you can have a low blood sugar. You are literally always trying to keep your blood sugar in balance, not too high, not too low goes too high, you feel lethargic, uh, you, and you cause yourself long-term damage. Too low, uh, you could fall off the wire. You'll lose your balance and fall off the wire. So you're literally thinking about this all day long. And type twos who are attentive to their disease, they'll be thinking about it too. It's all a question of where your blood sugar is. It's become part of my life that the first thing I do in the morning, to the last thing I do at night, and all through the day, I'm always wondering what's my blood sugar because it impacts what I can do. Uh, if I have to work out, I got to make sure that I eat some carbohydrates so I can burn it off and not go too low because exercise does drop your blood sugar. So there are all these adjustments that we have to make. I like that picture too, mainly because I visualize all these diabetics out there in society without the, the pole they're carrying for balance. But we're all out there walking on a tightrope, even though nobody sees that. That's what's going on. It's great. This is really, uh, it's, it's a powerful picture. I'm going to have it in, embedded um, uh, in, into the video. Um, another quick off-topic question. Uh, I, uh, what are some of your favorite movies? Um. I'm not a real big mo movie goer. Okay. Um, not, I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, I like movies, Calvin. I, I mean, I like action movies like, okay. uh, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark and stuff like that, you know, yeah. light stuff. Um, and I guess, well, I like Top Gun. You know, the, the first Top Gun I thought was better than the second one, but, you know, uh, it, it's an escape for me. 
and, and that's you know so there's nothing deep going on right you know okay. I'm not I'm not a film film buff that's fine per se. that's fine what's the what, 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 let me ask you this what, what's your favorite movie uh well it's casablanca okay it's casablanca uh um uh because it changed my life we're talking about favorite movies uh, w one day I, I watched Castle Banking for the 51st time 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, literally for the 51st time. Uh, and, and I love it. And I'm, I, uh, for, I'm, I mean, I love the movie. Uh, I, I, Bogart, uh, he's a great hero of mine. And at the end of the movie, there's a scene and uh, Bogart shoots the bad guy. It's 1942. And then Claude Rains, great character actor, picks up a bottle of Vichy water. It's like Perrier, French mineral water. Yeah. yeah. And, and and anything and and this is for, you know French Morocco anything with the word Vichy in it in 1942 meant you generally conspired with the Germans so it was a bad right you know, so Claude Rains throws that bottle of water uh, into a garbage and by the way this was this was life transformative you know, the bottle actually looked like this in, in the movie and it had a little label Vichy water um, uh, 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 and and in one second. When the bottle hit the garbage can, and again, you know, I was, you know, I was uh, in, in sales at the time, and, uh, but but in, in one second, I never wrote anything in my life before. But in one second, I grabbed my head and I said, "Oh my God!" And, and my wife said, "It's like Sanford, you know, when Fred Sanford used to say, hey, Elizabeth, I'm coming.' Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm yeah. Coming. And and I grabbed my head, and my wife yelled, "What happened? Are you all right?" I said, "Yeah, but there's a novel." in my head she what do you mean i said there's a novel in my head so i came downstairs here and i took five years to write this fishy water yep. a novel this was just a vehicle for me to change my life i quit selling and and, and became a journalist and a podcaster and a, a teacher at rutgers and uh it was a vehicle so it, it was all because of castle blanker and some spirit up there that anyway that's uh Moving on, that yeah, was a great cool. question you asked me. I'm, I'm glad you did, because uh, I was quick to bring that up. I also love From Here to Eternity, a wonderful uh, World War II movie. It takes place in Hawaii six months before Pearl Harbor. Right. Uh, yeah. Frank Sinatra, Montgomery Cliff, Deborah Carr, Burt Lancaster. Uh, I could just, uh, I could just watch that again and again. And The Godfather. Uh, I don't. I I I've watched it hundreds of times. I can't watch it anymore because I know all the lines. <laughs> There's no reason to watch it. I know well, the, the, they come in handy, don't they? they Every do. once in a while, you use one of those lines. They do, and I do all the time. I I say to uh, invariably, I'll say to family and friends, it's not personal, strictly business. You know. Yes. Right. You yeah. Know, like my exactly. Movie. Yes. You know, going back to older movies. So one movie movie that I do like is On the Waterfront. Wow. With Marlon Brando. Sure. I could have been a contender. Sure. You know, that that's a really gripping movie. Gripping, gripping. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of some palooka. Yep. Powerful, powerful, yep. powerful, powerful. Yeah, it was filmed here in Jersey uh, on the Hoboken uh, waterfront. I, yep. I, I'm, uh, I, I, I just watched a documentary on, on Marlon Brando's life. He narrated uh, it. Uh, and, huh. and, and, uh, you know, Brando was this, 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 and this, but, uh, a great thinker, you know. Uh, I don't think we all realize what a great intellect and thinker. No, he, I, I didn't. No, a, a, a really a great thinker, a great humanitarian. I mean, uh, uh, he he didn't accept the Academy Award for uh, playing Don Corleone. Uh, right. He had uh, uh, an, an Indian woman come up and accept and, and not accept the award but give a speech and i just learned and, and, and she wasn't even indian he didn't know that she was just an actress huh wow and and uh but uh a, a deep deep thinker uh and a caring human being uh and maybe greatest actor ever just you know i watch his stuff but on the waterfront and then he you know uh a street corner named desire um mm -hmm. I used to do a great uh, imitation of him yelling. <laughs> Stanley. <laughs> so, uh, actually, I did that once uh, in a parking lot. True story. I, I did that in a parking lot. We we had gone to a, um, a, a, a party, big party. I think it was a wedding. And in the parking lot of the hotel, uh, uh, and, and I, didn't, I, I didn't, I don't drink. So, but I just 
Something possessed me in the parking lot, and I started yelling, Stella, Stella. And, you know, you have a lot of echoes. And and it was loud. And, and, and about two or three or four minutes later, we, it was a long walk to the car. I, I heard police cars coming. Oh, so, no. Yeah, so I, I got out of there really quick. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. But I figured maybe they're after me for yelling, Stella. I do a really good Stella. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, uh, because you were talking about the picture. Um, and I'm curious to, to know this because you, you, you're you you're a role model for the community. Uh, but how have you coped emotionally and physically with this thing for the last 41 years? I guess I know that it, it really blows people away when they get that diagnosis. I've met enough diabetics to know that just about everybody is blown away. Um, I've always been somebody who takes things in stride. And I wasn't happy to become diabetic, but um, I just figured, well, that, that's what it is. You know, if, if you've got got this thing, it, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's it's not cancer. It's not MS. It's not a lot of other things that can't be dealt with. So at least you've got a fair chance of, of dealing with this. It's a pain and, and uh you know, as I mentioned earlier, I just decided, well, that's it. You're going to have to take a shot at least once a day for the rest of your life unless they cure this thing. And um, so for me, the coping has been more of a practical thing. For example, when I'm pouring metal in the foundry uh, back in those days, uh, I'd have to make sure that my sugar was never, ever going to go low. So I'd have to make sure that my sugar was high enough that um. it, uh, it, that would never happen. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it would be high when I was doing that, but then I'd have to do things to get it back down afterwards. It's a question of uh, understanding what you're doing. Uh, Dr. Elliot Jocelyn, he, he was a diabetes pioneer. Uh, he started treating diabetics before insulin was discovered. Wow. So the, the best he could do was to make people comfortable as much, much as he could uh, before they died, because it is a fatal disease without insulin. So... One of the things he said was the diabetic who knows the most lives the longest. And that is true. Uh, you know, what a diabetic has to know is what they're eating. Where are the carbohydrates? So you got to do some research. You got you to gotta know what you're putting into your body. Uh, you got to know what kinds of activity are going to lower your blood sugar. And there's a whole bunch of things you need to know about yourself because this disease is highly individualized. Yeah, it's, in fact, it's been said that no two cases may be exactly alike because it's so complex. So you really have to be aware of your own body and how you're going to use the basic techniques to, to keep your blood glucose levels in check. So I've learned about it. And I've done the things I needed to do. So far, I've had it for over 40 years and I'm doing okay. So I, I know there are people who have had it for as much as 80 years. And they're they're doing okay. So uh, these are people who learned what to did, do and then did it. So I guess I'm just one of those people. You know, you just hunker down and do what you got to do. Uh, it, it, to me, getting upset about things just in general isn't very productive. So I didn't get upset. I think my wife was more upset about this than I was. So, so anyway, I guess that that's my answer. Okay, well, that's a that's a it's a great answer. Um, what we can do, uh, we as a society. Now, uh, another curious question to ask you, and and I keep reading and seeing little blips and blurbs. Uh, why, if we've discussed the fact that one out of seven overweight people get it, so it's not an obesity disease, but why am I reading? And hearing blips and blurbs that the world is heading towards an epidemic of diabetes. We may have discussed this a week or two ago. Why is that? I don't think we really know. Uh, if, if you if you don't have insulin resistance, which is the underlying cause of type 2 diabetes, which when we talk about diabetes, that's really what we're talking about because 90 to 95% of cases are type 2. We don't know where why insulin resistance stops or starts. 
we know things that impact it, you know, like the visceral fat. You know, we know how that impacts it, but we really don't know why it starts. All we know is that there is a genetic component to it. So it may be the way the medical profession defines diabetes, and, and this is a root of a lot of the misperceptions out there. I had a doctor one time tell me that insulin resistance and diabetes were two different diseases. Well, they're, if they're, the way I look at it in a common sense way is that we know that you won't have type two if you don't have insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the, the, uh, the thing that you have to have first. So if you separate it, like this doctor did, you can say that, well, we've got, you have insulin resistance, but you don't have diabetes unless your blood sugar gets to a high enough level that it reaches the threshold where we can call it diabetes. I'm thinking maybe there's a lot more insulin resistance out there than we knew of. And maybe because of our diets and we're eating a lot more carbohydrate than we used to, that people who have insulin resistance who may not have hit the diabetic level are now hitting it. That's all I can figure. And that's just speculation on my part. Right. right. But, it, but it doesn't make sense to me that all of a sudden we have a lot more insulin resistance. But maybe we do. You know, maybe there's something out there that's causing more insulin resistance. We, we really don't know. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating, provocative s statement to read that we're heading for an epidemic because it, it's like slapping people and say, hey, lose weight and that'll take care of you. Uh, uh, and maybe it's a glib thing saying that the world is heading for an epidemic. Well, we don't know why. Uh, you know, we don't know why. You know, it's funny. I... I I take all of medicine and and how advanced we are and and, and I read I mean I, I just read a dozen different articles a day on everything under the sun anything that's remotely related to me or people I know I I, I read you know I've got my own things and and I study and I read uh uh, uh and and my my uh, spiritual healer said that's part of my 1200 year old soul I always had this desire to read and to and, and, and read and, and 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 to learn, um, uh, um, uh, um, but I I can't um, with with all that we know. What I'm trying to say is, with all that we know, and it's 2024, we don't know a lot. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You know, because things are infinitely complex. You know, we we can. Uh, you know, take the layers off the onion, but there's always another layer to, to learn about. You know, with, with diabetes in particular, uh, we, we do know a lot, but we really don't know a lot of the key things that we need to know. And someday, if we unravel why insulin resistance happens, uh, we can come up with a way to prevent it from happening. So, you know, that, that may well be in the future. I mean, you and I have been around long enough that we've seen things happen that it was science fiction. Correct. years ago uh, right. frankly even in diabetes what what we have right now is science fiction when i first got this back in uh, the early 1980s uh the only way you would know what your blood sugar was by taking a stuff they called test tape it was a yellow I paper that. i remember that okay well sure. it, it, was, it was a you yellow put paper your finger that... and you put your tape there no actually actually it was a test of your urine Oh, okay. you know, this was before uh, we could we could do the test strip thing with the, the monitors. You know, all you could do was uh, dip this thing in a sample of urine. If it stayed yellow, then your blood sugar was okay. If it turned a, ver a shade of green, you know, that had various gradations, but it was up to black. You know, when it turned black, you knew your blood sugar was really high. But that was information from two hours ago when the when the urine was produced by your body. So this was old information, but it was the best we had. Then we had uh, glucometers that came in with, that do what you, you were talking about, where you take a little blood sample, and that would tell you instantly what your blood glucose level was right then. So that was a huge improvement. And now we've got continuous glucose uh, monitors where you're, it'll tell you like I can look at my monitor right now and it'll tell me what my blood sugar is. Wow. I can do that anytime I want wow. without having to take a blood sample. 
So we have got the tools to manage this. I mean, yeah, the stuff yeah. that we have now was just, like I said, it was science fiction 30 years ago. You know, it's it, funny. Is. It, you know it is mind boggling. Um, when I came down with AFib, uh, uh, I, the only way I knew I was in, in AFib, I could feel my heart racing like triple, quadruple, and I'd have to run to the doctor and they'd hook me up to an EKG and say, yeah, you're in AFib. And I said, well, I kind of felt it, but you weren't sure, but I felt it. And then three or four years ago, uh, they came out with this. It's an EKG what machine. is that? It's an EKG machine. This takes my, this spits out my EKG either on my phone or my iPad. Wow. A hundred percent accurate. So wow. I, put my, I put my two fingers on it like that. 30 seconds. There's my EKG. Incredible. By the way, it is for me a lifesaver. Because I'm I'm on top of this whole thing, and uh, in in you know if if two week period of time goes on, and you know I'm still in AFib, and you know, I, I'm pretty friendly with my doctor. I said, "I, right, it's time to paddle me." So I have to go into the hospital, and they paddle me, hmm. and when they put me to sleep, and they paddle me, and they kick me into normal rhythm. Oh. Uh, but it, it's because I monitor it better. Some I, and 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 I have the ability to send the EKG to them to look at. There's no reason wow. to I know I'm an AFib. It tells me it's more, it's marvelous. And, 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 and the sign, and I remember test tape because I used to sell it. You know, it's from Eli Lilly, I think, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, they're a big diabetes. Um, but I, I remember all that stuff because I, I, I was a pharmacist. I sold it. Sure. So we, we've come a long way. So winding down, uh, where, where can is this on amazon it is fine yeah there, there are two diabetes books on amazon fine uh, uh and uh any other comments and things you want to kind of add chat well well i just like to talk about the videos uh yes you I, go to my, I, yes yeah you can go to my website uh, the videos are available there the website is challenge diabetes dot us uh everybody puts in dot com but it's actually dot us okay but you can get the videos there and this is the best thing that i've done over the past year or so i worked on putting these videos together it'll help individuals certainly but what i'm really hoping is that people will uh, buy them or rent them and show them to groups if you have a civic a uh, church, a uh, book club, you know, whatever group you belong to. If you could show these to the group, we would reach a lot of people. Uh, the videos are less than uh, 30 minutes long. So if you have a one hour meeting, you can show the video and then talk about it for a half an hour, if not longer. And this to me is the most powerful thing that I do. When I was doing classes uh, back before COVID, I always found that the best part of the whole program was after I did the presentation and people talked about their own experiences. And that's what you'll find if you watch these videos with other people. They'll all either have diabetes stories about themselves or a relative, or they'll have questions because they don't have it, but they fear getting it. You know, you'll, you'll be surprised at how lively those discussions become. So that's really what I hope people will do. Uh, and I think you can attest, Calvin, that there's a lot of really good information packed into a, a pretty short video. Well, uh, I took six pages of notes last night watching your video that you sent to me. Six pages of notes. And and, and again, and I I circled. I even went back and looked at it and circled things that, that uh, as smart as I thought I was, uh, I, I didn't know a heck of a lot. And, and that's what the video really taught me. Uh, it did uh and and uh, again it's it's i just think it's critically essential for anybody whether you have it or not because it's right. in your world it's in your world one way or another right so it, it's a great it, and and when the video is really ready to roll you'll send me stuff and i'll promote it and, and you know i'm all yours because great uh, i appreciate it no i'm a believer i'm just glad um I always call it the universe, uh, for lack of a better. I'm glad the universe put us together because, uh, as I said, I'm looking at a picture of my grandmother over there. Uh, you know, she had diabetes. She lost a leg. 
uh, um, so it's been part of my life since she's holding me. I was one year old. Wow. It's been part of my life, my whole life. You know, she had it in the insulin and stuff. So I'm just glad the universe, you know, brought us together. Um, me too. Truly, truly, truly. So, um, I thank you for your time, uh, and, and your graciousness, your passion, uh, for your energy, uh, and um, officially welcome you to come back in any shape, way, or form. When the video, wonderful, we, we can talk about the video again. When, if you want to do a little panel, and people have seen the video, and con whatever your imagination, uh, I'm here because uh, uh, I believe in what you're doing, Chad. Uh, it's so important. That's great, Calvin. I, I really appreciate it. No, I do. My pleasure.